about uh, MIP star equal to RE, one of the biggest breakthroughs in complexity in the last few years. Um, thanks, Prasad. So you can you can hear me. Uh, good morning. I'll um, echo Irit's uh, words in saying that. Um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure and uh, and an honor to be uh, here speaking at the at the celebration. And I also very much want to thank the the Simons Institute for uh, its continued support of TCS and quantum computing in particular. Uh, that's had a pretty big importance in my uh, in my research career. So I participated right after I ended my PhD. I participated in one of the first programs here in quantum Hamiltonian complexity. Actually, was the first program in the that was in, in Calvin Hall. Um, and some of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, were born during that program. So I'll, I'll point it out in a, at a particular place in the, in the talk. And we're having right now, of course, uh, another quantum reunion uh, over over the summer. So. Um, it's really been a great institute to, uh, to have around. So the result that I'm going to talk about is a, is a result in quantum complexity theory. It's, it's summarized in the equality that, that gives the title to the talk. Uh, this is an equality between two complexity classes uh, that, that I'll define a little bit uh, uh, later in the talk. Um, this equality is, uh, is interesting from a complexity theoretic point of view. Um, but uh, some of its importance is also due to the um, impact and applications that it's had to questions in the in the foundations of uh, of quantum mechanics and also in uh, in pure mathematics. Um, so I'm going to try to give you all uh, the different perspectives on, on the results, just introduce it and, and motivate it. Um, and, and and I'll start with the the physical angle uh, because that's uh, that's often more uh, more fun. Uh, so in order to do that, I have to go back uh, quite a bit in the past to the 1930s. Uh, so in the 1930s, um, you know, lots of stuff was going on. So uh, Mickey Mouse uh, made its first apparition. Uh, some other less fun things, uh, you know, stock, stock market crash happened. Um, okay, the more relevant to the talk is, is this particular headline, uh, which is actually, if you take the time to read it, uh, qu quite a remarkable riff on the... Um, so this is New York Times 1935. So of course they're referring to the uh, einstein podolsky rosen uh, thought experiment, uh, which if you know about it, you can understand what, what, what they're saying. If you don't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, so, so, okay, so I'm not gonna go into the details of that, uh, of that uh, thought experiment. Um, instead, I want to uh, give you, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, just um, one angle on it, uh, which, is, which is relevant for the talk. Um, so a particular aspect of quantum mechanics that uh, puzzled DPR and, and, and many um, at, at the time is uh, what, what we refer to as the non-locality of, of quantum mechanics. So to explain that, I have to describe um, a thought experiment. So the thought experiment is as follows. You imagine that you have two physical systems, uh, A and B. Uh, each of them receives um, inputs taken from a certain range of inputs, and they produce uh, outputs also in a certain range. So think of these as just um, numbers. Um, uh, so we think of these physical systems as being isolated. So one of them is on uh, Earth and the other is on, on, moon, on the moon. And the question is, uh, what's the right way to model mathematically uh, the kind of situations that you can observe uh, in this scenario? Um, so if you model this classically, the, the first, the most natural um, way to do it is to say, well, uh, you know, you have the A system, the B system, um, these are separated. So let's just have a distribution uh, that models what happens at A. So this is distribution on outcomes given the, the inputs and the distribution what models at, uh, that, that models what happens at B. And the global distribution is, is a product distribution between these two because there's no interaction um, between these two systems. Um, you could say, oh, but, um, you know, the Earth and the Moon, there's the Big Bang, they were, they were created together at some point, so there can be some correlation that has been injected into these systems long in the past, and you can model that correlation using what's, what's sometimes referred to as a, as a, as a lo local hidden variable, so this is just a, a distribution um, on random variables, lambda, you sampled some lambda in, in the past, and there's a copy of it that's sitting on the Earth and a copy of it that's sitting on the Moon, and so these distributions, uh, these local distributions can also depend on, 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 on lambda. Okay, so you'd say, uh, this is a reasonable model for the class of distributions that can be generated uh, in, in, in my thought experiment. Okay, they must have this form. And you can plot them. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of important for the talk to understand what the picture on the left uh, is. So each point in this picture is a vector 
uh, of probabilities, okay? It's all the, the probabilities, um, they're all probabilities that, that are used to model such an experiment. So if X and Y are both zero, what's the probability that A and B are both zero, uh, that they're both one, that they're zero and one, et cetera. So each of these probabilities is an entry in the vector, and this vector I represent using a single point, and then I can draw a polytope, which is the class of all distributions that can be generated uh, using, this, uh, using this experiment. It's a polytope and the extreme points are product uh, deterministic product distributions. And then when I introduced this lambda um, in terms of the picture, this amounted to taking the, the convex hull of the, of the extreme points, All right? Uh, so that's if you model the experiment classically. Now, if you model it using quantum mechanics, uh, the main difference is that this uh, um, kind of correlation that comes from the past between the two systems, you can, you, you can say that um, there's some physical system, like think of a pair of photons or something like this, that was created in the past in a, in a certain physical state. And then one of the photons just stayed on Earth uh, and the other was just you know, in, in, in the moon. And so when you do the experiment, uh, these outcomes A and B that are generated on Earth and on moon, these, these can be correlated with the state of the photons. Okay, Maybe some measurement happens on the photon and the A is, is, contains some information about that photon. But of course, A contains only information about the photon that's on Earth and B about the photon that's, that's on the moon. Uh, and now you ask uh, the physicist, okay, well, what's the class of distributions that can be generated in this experiment? And they'll write for you the, the Born rule. Um, so it's, it's not important to understand this formula right now. Uh, psi is a, is a vector. It's the, the state uh, vector that, that represents the state of my photons. And A and B are, are measurements that are performed on, on the Earth and on the Moon. Um, what is important is just that if you plot it, you get a bigger set. Um, and that, that, that's part of, of course, the EPR thought experiment is much more subtle than that, um, but it is part of what, what was confusing. It's that your intuition really uh, tells you that the correct class of this, I don't, I, I guess I can move. The class of distributions is, is this class of distributions, okay? You have some local operation at Alice, local operation at B, you take the convex hull, it's the most natural thing in the world. And now you have a new theory of physics and it says, well, um, there is uh, a bigger set of correlations that, that can be observed. And so you try to understand, well, okay, what does that mean? Like what, what kind of things about the world do I have to revisit uh, in order to accommodate uh, this, this, this new picture? Uh, and that's what EPR were, were doing. Um, okay, so, so there's experiments that, that are performed to, to demonstrate this. This is one of the first experiments in the 80s. This is one uh, more recent in 2012 in, uh, in Delft. And even more recently, um, you, you can do these experiments using satellites that beam the pair of photons to different cities in, in China, for example, and then the measurements are performed and you check the statistics and you do all the statistics, you compute all the probabilities, you plot it on the figure and you see it's outside of the classical set. Okay, so you just have to accept this. All right, so um, experiments, they kind of demonstrate uh, what is possible. So you can uh, think of them as, as, as lower bounds. Um, uh, but we might also be interested in, in upper bounds uh, on, on what is achievable. Um, and that's what uh, mathematicians uh, do. So the, these pictures in terms of correlations, uh, they, they were first introduced by a uh, Israeli mathematical physicist, Boris Silson, and he, he drew all these sets. Um, so he drew the classical set that I, had, uh, that I, that I gave you before, and he drew the quantum set. Um, and as he was thinking through them, he realized that in fact, and this was in the 1980s, so Einstein, Bohr, these people were you know, gone, unfortunately. Um, still, it wasn't quite decided what was the proper way to model what can be achieved in quantum mechanics. Okay, so there's different mathematical ways to do it. One of them I gave you already. Um, and this way of doing it, um, it, it, it consists in saying that um, the way you should model things that the Earth is a particular system, and to that system we associate a Hilbert space. Quantum mechanics is based on Hilbert spaces. You have a Hilbert space for the Earth, Hilbert space for Moon, and then how do you represent the fact that these are isolated? Uh, you take the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces. It's this tensor product that uh, that is that is here, and the state vector lies in the tensor product of the spaces. Okay, so if that if that's the math that you accept, then you get this set. Um, but Tilson observed that there's a, a slightly more general definition you could give. Uh, it's, it's inspired by uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, you could forget about this idea that there has to be different Hilbert spaces for different space-time regions, because what, what does that mean? Like each system has a different Hilbert space. It's, it's very confusing. So there's just a single Hilbert space for the whole universe. And the way you represent spatial isolation is using commutation. So you say, okay, whatever operation is performed on the earth, whatever operation is performed on the moon, because they're isolated, the order in which I perform these operations shouldn't matter. Um, but that's the only constraint that I'm placing. 
Um, and so if you do that, you get a, a set that a priori could be different. It's, it's bigger because the, the tensor product is, is, is it implies commutation, um, but, but vice versa is, is not clear. Um, I, actually, Tilton thought that the two definitions are equal. And if, if you know a little bit of math, um, you, you can show without too much work that if everything is finite dimensional, these definitions are equal. And so you could say, you know, that's fine, right? That they're equal. Uh, later on, people realized that I, actually there could be a difference between these sets. And so whether there is a difference or not, this became known as, as Tilson's problem. Okay, Tilson's problem is just, you have these two possible mathematical ways of modeling locality in quantum mechanics. Do they give rise to the same distributions or do they not? Um, so that question was posed in the 90s, I think. Um, and um, you know, so the question is whether there's a point there. Um, and you could say, okay, like, fine. That's a question in, in the foundations where you just told me that if everything is finite dimensional, it, it doesn't matter. And we're computer scientists, everything is finite dimensional. So let's just move on, right? And then basically that's what happened. Um, the question was posed, it didn't, it didn't really matter too much and, and people moved on. Um, until uh, in the 90s, there was a very surprising connection that was established between this problem and some problems that had been open uh, in, in, in the theory of operator algebra, so in mathematics for a couple, uh, or uh, for, for, for four, four decades. Um, and this connection gave much, suddenly gave more importance to Tilson's problem. So I'm gonna do like a tiny bit of mathematics now to explain the, the, the mathematical angle. Um, for that, I have to go back to the 1930s a second time. There'll be a third time a little bit later. Um, so in the 1930s, um, people were still developing the math uh, for quantum mechanics. So there was uh, Schrodinger's um, you know, wave formulation. There was uh, Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. And the matrix mechanics was uh, picked up by, uh, by von Neumann, who's a, who's a mathematician. And he started developing all the math required uh, to make the physicists, um, you know, scribbles, um, <laughs> no offense, man, uh, rigorous. Um, and so he did this, it took quite a while. So um, together with uh, Murray, he, he developed the theory of what are known, now known uh, of, as von Neumann algebras. And he pushed it much further than what's required for the, uh, for the physics. So they started, um, you know, investigating different types of von Neumann algebras um, and classifying these, uh, these von Neumann algebras. Now, Alan Collins is, is another mathematician who in the, in the 1970s, so you know, 40 years later, they were still hard working on this classification work. In fact, Collins got, got the, the Fields Medal for his work on classifying uh, von Neumann algebras. And in one of these papers, um, one of his major papers, he, he made a comment about, you know, it looked like some algebra had some finite dimensional model. And he said, oh, it should be the case that every kind of such algebra has a finite dimensional approximation. He wasn't sure about it and he moved on. Um, but that, that particular comment um, later became known as, as Kahn's embedding problem. So I, I, I can't define it precisely. Um, it, it's a problem that, that, that gained prominence due to the work of other mathematicians that connected it to, to more conjectures in operator algebras, C-star algebras, then it went outside of that, uh, for example, to free probability or, or, or um, group theory. So, so let me give, just to give you a flavor of what this conjecture is about, I'll state uh, a slightly weaker conjecture, but it's easier to formulate. It's a conjecture in group theory. So it's a question whether every countable group is, is hyperlinear. Um, so let's first think about finite groups. Uh, so everyone knows that finite groups have finite dimensional representations. So if you have any finite group, you can realize it as uh, operations on matrices, okay? There's a bunch of matrices that are gonna multiply exactly like you asked them to multiply in a group. That's for finite groups. Now, what about infinite groups? Infinite groups don't necessarily have finite dimensional representations. Uh, what about approximate finite dimensional representations? So that's the question. This is a conjecture, it's an open, it's an open problem. Uh, the problem is whether every countable group, so just the number of elements in the group is countable, is, is hyperlinear. And it's hyperlinear if every finite subset of the group can be arbitrarily well approximated by finite dimensional matrices. Uh, but the dimension of the matrices can grow with the quality of the approximation and with the size of the subset of the group that you're trying to approximate, okay? So Kahn's embedding problem has a very similar flavor, but it, it's, a, it's about algebras and not, uh, and not groups. Okay, so around 2011, 2012, um, due to the work of some mathematicians, some mathematical physicists showed that this, this Kahn's embedding problem, which was open since 1976, so for 50 years already, uh, this was equivalent to Tillerson's problem. 
Uh, it's kind of a surprising equivalence because Tilson's problem is a problem about the equality between two convex sets. Uh, there's no algebra that's obviously visible uh, there. Kahn's embedding problem has no tensor products, it's just about a single algebra. So this is a very surprising connection. And it, it suddenly you know, gave, um, um, uh, made people interested in Tilson's problem again, uh, because it, it kind of gives you a new angle on some old uh, mathematical conjectures. Okay, so that, that's what we're gonna to try to do now. Um, we're interested in Tilson's problem, and we're gonna to try to resolve it. Um, so a priori, it's a pretty simple problem. Um, it's, it's really a problem between equality of two convex sets, uh, which are the nicest kind of sets that, that, uh, that you might wanna consider. And also I wanna emphasize that these sets are not like infinite dimensional or anything. This is all in finite dimensions. So I can draw my sets in a, in a, in a cube, and this cube lives in a space that has dimension you know, the number of inputs and outputs that I have for my thought experiment. N is the number of inputs, K is the number of outputs. This question is interesting when N and K are both equal to five, okay? So you don't need to think of very, uh, very, very, very large pictures. Okay, so you have two convex sets, uh, you wanna separate them, how do you do it? Uh, you find a linear function uh, that separates them, okay? So I can draw a linear function like this, and given the linear function, I can ask for what's the maximum that the linear function takes over any of the three convex sets that's in the picture. Um, I can give a name to this maximum. So this omega is the maximum over the, the first quantum set, the one that's modeled using tensor product. This is the maximum over the, uh, the second one, the one that's measured using commuting operations. And if we could just find one linear function such that we can show that these two optimum are distinct, we'd be done. Um, so then you say, okay, well, you know, why, why don't you do this, right? Computing optimum of linear functions over convex sets, that's, that's easy. Um, so just like, you know, discretize your space, search over all linear functionals, compute these optimums and, and just find it if it exists. It, the problem is that computing optimums of um, linear functions over convex sets is easy uh, if, okay, if this convex set is, is like minimally reasonable, in particular, if you have a membership oracle, okay? If, if you have a way to test given the point, is it in the convex set? And that's, that's you know, usually the case. This is why we say that linear optimization over convex sets is easy, but it's not the case for these sets, okay? Because you saw the definition, it involves these Tesla products and these Hilbert spaces. And a priori, I don't have um, a way given a point to test whether it's, it's in the set or not. Um, so I don't know how to optimize these, these linear functions. So we need to find other ways uh, to construct interesting linear functions and say things about them. And um, that's what we're gonna do for the remainder of the talk. And the way we'll do it is by drawing kind of a surprising connection with a third uh, area, which is, which is uh, complexity theory, and in particular, the theory of interactive proofs. Uh, so let me explain this now. I have to go back again to the 1930s. Um, actually, it's not true. I don't have to go back to the 1930s, but, but still, just for the sake of it. Um, okay, so we're all familiar with, uh, with that theory. I don't need to explain it. Um, in, in fact, Turing is gonna show up again right at the end of the talk. Uh, but, but for now, let me put this aside um, and tell you about interactive proofs. Uh, so, so let's start from the basics, say the complexity class NP. So N, NP, of course, stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. Uh, but shortly after the class was, was introduced, um, I think people realized that there's a different way to think about it that, that's proven particularly uh, insightful. So it's thinking about NP as the class of problems that have efficiently verifiable proofs. Okay, so you, um, a problem in this class should be such that there's a deterministic polynomial time uh, procedure. This is this V there and it gets a instance of the problem. It's trying to decide if this instance is a yes or no instance. In order to do that, it can run in polynomial time, um, but it can also receive help in the form of a proof. Um, and so it should be the case that inputs that are in the language have valid proofs that are accepted and inputs that are not in the language uh, do not have valid proofs. Okay? That, that, that's an equivalent definition of the class. Um, NP. So this was in the 70s uh, that NP completeness uh, theory was, was, was developed. Now, um, jumping to the, 80, the 80s, another particularly insightful observation uh, was made. And this observation came from two different angles, but one of them is uh, cryptography, where in cryptography, these proofs are you know, actual things that you're doing. Like think about proving your identity to an ATM or something, you're, you're doing this, okay? So it's, it's not like some theoretical non-deterministic algorithm. Um, and studying a, a certain property that such proofs can have the zero knowledge property. Um, um, uh, researchers, including Shafi, 
Shafi um, uh, uh, started studying what happened if you broaden the class a little bit and you allow not just deterministic verification, but you allow two extra things. One of them is interaction with the proof, which we now model as a, as a prover. So it's a machine that you can ask questions to. And you also allow randomized verification. So you're allowed to make errors with, uh, with a small probability. Uh, this, this leads to a, a new complexity class IP and, and further work uh, showed that IP seems to be bigger than P space. So it seems to there be a, an expressive gain in uh, verification power that's, that's obtained by adding uh, randomness and interaction. So you get, you get, you get P space. Okay, 80s now, 90s, uh, one last conceptual leap. Uh, this one again motivated by, by cryptography and again studying uh, zero knowledge. You can ask if it makes a difference if the verification procedure is allowed to ask uh, questions, interact with two provers instead of one. Uh, so you, you, you know, it's, this is not obvious that there's any gain to this at first because uh, you know, what's the point of having two proofs? You just you know, put them together and it's just one proof. But if you remember that this procedure is interactive, uh, then, then you might see the advantage. It's a bit like uh, interrogating suspects and you put them in different rooms. This allows you to uh, cross check their answers and you gain a little bit verification power. So there's maybe fewer chances that someone uh, is, is able to convince you of a false statement. Um, and indeed this is the case. And um, uh, so this, the, the associated complexity class is called MIP. Uh, bye bye for now Lund in 91 showed that it's equal to NX. Okay, so it's important here. There's been an exponential gain uh, in the complexity of problems that you can verify as you moved from static deterministic verification to interactive randomized verification with two provers. Okay, there's three more ingredients. You had an exponential gain uh, in, in power. Uh, and offshoots of this result include the PCP theorem that Irit uh, told, told us a lot about. So even though this PCP theorem, when you state it, has nothing to do with interactive proofs, uh, this, this, is, this, is where it came, this is where it came from. Okay, that's the classical theory of quantum of, of, of interactive proofs. Uh, and now quantum computation comes along and it just opens up like a whole new set of questions. You can ask, oh, well, what if the proof is quantum? What if the interaction involves quantum communication? Uh, how does that change the complexity classes? And these are things that, that have been studied extensively and I'm not gonna do the whole theory there. I just wanna focus on one particular modification that's been particularly uh, uh, useful and productive. So, um, it starts off with a uh, multi-prover. I'll just focus on the case where there's two provers here on uh, interactive proofs. And the only change you make is the same change that you made that I made in the thought experiment I described earlier. You say, well, what if we think of this as something that's actually physically uh, embodied that is happening? These two provers are there. One is on Earth, one is on the Moon. Well, you know, what, what if they have photons between them? There's no way I can present, prevent them from, from sharing photons. Um, how does that affect uh, the, the, the model? Um, that's a question that was raised um, you know, 20 years ago by, by Cleve and, and collaborators. They coined the, the name for the class MIP star. So star just refers to the fact that there's entanglement between the provers. And they asked, what's the expressive power uh, of, of that class? And it's interesting to think through this because there's really two different phenomena that could be taking place. Uh, the first one is that uh, what I just did is I broadened the range of strategies that are accessible to the provers, okay? Before, there were two prisoners, let's say they were isolated in different rooms and they had to perform local operations in order to determine their answers. Now I give them a little bit more, I give them photons, okay? So I give them access to a slightly broader class of strategies. Uh, using these strategies, they might be able to cheat uh, in, in, in situations where they weren't able to cheat before. If they cheat, they defeat the soundness of my proof system and the verification power of the verifier could be reduced. Maybe if these correlations are so strong, I completely lose any advantage there and two provers are no better than just one. And in that case, this complexity class MIP star would collapse to the single prover class IP uh, to P space. So that's something that could happen. On the other hand, um, you know, your verification procedure knows this. Um, so maybe you can use it to your advantage. Uh, if the provers are more powerful in a way, they have different correlations, maybe we can develop new tests um, that would affect the completeness of my proof system. And I'd be able to verify things that I wasn't able to verify uh, before. Okay, so this is also something like a little bit more strange, but it could be happening. You know? Uh, I want to give you a, co a concrete example of the kind of uh, tests or games that you play in this uh, setting. This is, a, this is a very simple one called the odd cycle game. Um, so in the odd cycle game, you imagine in your head the odd cycle. So this one has, has five vertices. And what you do in the game is that you try to check that um, the odd cycle is, is too colorable. 
Okay, so of course, because it's, it's odd, it's not too colorable. Uh, but if you try to check it, here's one way you might do it. You might pick a pair of uh, vertices. So the first vertex, I chose the vertex I, and I ask one of the provers for the color of that vertex, and they'll tell me, you know, it's either green or blue. And then I choose for the other prover either the same vertex, and then I'll make sure they give me the same answer just to check that they're consistent, or a neighboring vertex. And then I check that they give me different uh, answers. Okay, and it's important that these two provers, they only see which vertex they're asked about, not what the other person was asked about. So they don't really have a good way uh, to, to uh, coordinate. Um, and so it's not hard to see that if I was playing this game with an even uh, cycle, the provers could fix uh, a two coloring of the even cycle and they could succeed in the game of probability one. But if the cycle is odd and has n vertices, you can compute the maximum success probability and it's, it's that, that, that number. Basically, there must be an error somewhere, right? Either they give different answers for this, different colors for the same vertex, or there's an edge that's not too colored. And now you can ask the question, what if I look at quantum strategies in this game? Um, does it change the success probability? And, and, and the point is that it does. So you can do the computation and the success probability gets, gets a little bit higher. So I'm showing you this example just to show that, uh, to argue that the, the difference between these two sets of strategies doesn't only happen for like weird things that you don't care about, okay? This, this is a very natural game, we care about it. And there is a difference between quantum and classical strategies for it. Um, all right, so I want just to, you know, I'll get back to my original question, citizens problem a little bit later, but I still, so that you know where we're going, I want to make the connection now. So these games, such as the odd cycle game, you can think of them as linear functions. It's really just the same thing. So here I'm drawing again the picture and this picture earlier, I said there each point on this picture is a probability vector. So each point is a strategy, okay? It's a, it's each point represents a class of distributions that uh, my, my provers or my players could be generating uh, in a certain game. And here I have the kind of classical distributions, so convex combinations of product. This is the first quantum one and I didn't draw uh, the second quantum one. And what the game does is it assigns a score to any possible strategy. And in fact, and, 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 and this, this function from strategy to score is a linear uh, function. So the odd cycle, you can represent it as a linear function like this. And the fact that there was a larger success probability uh, for quantum strategies, this is represented pictorially by the fact that there's a gap here between the two different optima of this linear function on the classical set and, 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 and on the quantum set, right? Um, it's a linear function because how do you compute the score in the game? You sum over all possible questions and answers of the probability of giving these answers and questions, that's an entry in my vector, times one or zero, it, whether this answer is, is, is valid or not. Okay, so you're just summing a subset of the probabilities and that, that's a linear function. Not all linear functions are of this form, but games give us a large class of linear functions to think about and try to find separations between not these two sets, I just did that, but the blue one and the purple one that, that, that we had earlier. No. Okay, so let's go back to the theory of interactive proofs. I have to develop a little bit, uh, a little bit more. So we have this question about the power of, uh, of quantum interactive proofs. Uh, that, that question was, was opened in, in 2004 when the class was, uh, was developed. And, and so, so people started you know, trying to work on it. So one of the first results is a result that, that I had at the end of my PhD with Ito. Um, and what we showed is that this potential collapse that I described earlier, where it could be that uh, these quantum strategies are used to defeat your proof system, this doesn't happen in general. Uh, in fact, we showed that it doesn't happen for a specific proof system, but that's the important one. It's a proof system that was used in the Baba et al paper showing that MIP is equal to NX. Uh, the main ingredient in that proof system is something called multilinearity test. It's not important that I get into that. And we showed that for that particular game, there's not a big gap between the classical and the quantum values. There could be a gap, uh, but it's not that big enough to defeat uh, the proof system. And so it, it showed this inclusion. And so I was there, this was the end of my PhD. I was pretty happy with it. And I thought, hey, you know, we're probably pretty much done now. Uh, a little bit, I, I didn't quite know how to prove a matching upper bound. So to show equality, but I thought it was gonna happen uh, pretty soon. Um, okay, but I didn't manage. Um, and then I went to the assignments um, and I co-organized one of the workshops there. And in the workshop, we had a RAMP session and uh, Umesh uh, Vazirani was there and also Dorit uh, Ronov. And they kind of like pumped me up at the, at the start of the RAMP session saying, look, you know, like uh, is NX really the right answer? These are quantum proof systems. So why don't you put QMAX uh, in there? 
uh, QMA is just the quantum analog of NP where you have a quantum proof. Um, and I thought, hmm, you know, this is kind of weird because still these questions and answers are classical. So why, why would you have a quantum, quantum proof in there? Okay, but I posed it as an open question and someone in the audience had an idea. This is Joe Fitzsimmons. Uh, and we worked out the idea. And then I had later work with uh, Anand Natarayana, Natarayan, sorry, Anand. Um, I'm not stating what these results are because it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that they, they kind of answered uh, the question. Uh, the only thing that I want to say about them that, that's a little bit relevant is that in order to show these results, you had to do a little bit more than take a classical test and show that it's sound against quantum provers. You really had to do what I said earlier, invent a new proof system. Try to say, okay, now we're going to go beyond what's possible classically. So you have to, we have to come up with a test that cannot be passed if you do not have entanglement. So it's really a test for entanglement. And this is what we developed. And that test for entanglement is based on a very famous classical uh, test called the bloom louis rubenfeld linearity test. So the linearity test is some procedure you can execute in order to verify that uh, the provers uh, determine their answers according to a, a linear function, uh, a linear function from the additive group uh, Z2 to the N to the multiplicative group uh, plus minus one. Uh, with the test that we developed, uh, it, it involves verifying that the provers answer according to like a quantum linear function if you want. So now it's a representation uh, linear functions are just representations, uh, but it's Z2 is, is a, a billion group. So representations are, are just characters. They're just one dimensional. P2 is, is the quantum analog of, of, of Z2. It's, it's the, the group that's generated by, by a qubit, if you want. So uh, you can take these two matrices. These are famous matrices in quantum information. They're called the Pauli matrices. Uh, what's special about them is that they square to identity. Uh, so just like a bit, you know, plus minus one square to identity. So a quantum analog of a bit, but they don't commute, okay? Uh, bits commute, qubits don't commute. So they generate a group, which is a non-abelian group, and it's this group uh, P2. Um, uh, this group has a unique non-trivial representation. It's the one that's generated by these, uh, by these matrices. And the, the quantum linearity test tests that strategies act according to these, uh, these matrices. This is, this is, this is not uh, crucial, but I, I want to I show you in the picture what's going on because there, there is something interesting. So these are my three sets. And now let's think about the linearity test, the classical linearity test as a, as a linear function, right? I told you any game or any test is a linear function. So what kind of linear function is it? So it's that kind, okay? Um, first of all, it doesn't point to a particular vertex because there's many possible strategies that can succeed any linear strategy or any convex combination of strategies. So what it points at is to a facet and it's a facet whose extreme points are um, essentially uh, linear, linear, uh, linear functions. And earlier when we did this quantum soundness work, we showed that th this is not a facet that's particularly interesting quantumly. Uh, you can play the same test with quantum provers and you get the same class of optimal strategies. Okay, so it's all the three sets, they kind of match here. In contrast, this quantum linearity test, it's, it's a different kind of uh, linear function. It points like more than this way. First of all, there's a difference between classical and quantum. Uh, classical strategies cannot succeed uh, in that test. It requires entanglement. And second, um, there's a unique quantum optimum. There's not a whole family of them. There's really a unique quantum strategy that, that, that succeeds in the, in the test. That'll be relevant in a, in, in, in a second. All right, so um, at this point, you know, I told you about many different things, uh, but it's, it's good. We have all the ingredients that are needed in order to make uh, progress on, on this question of understanding the power of quantum interactive proofs and then circling back to, to Tillerson's problem. Uh, so I want to give you just like one, you know, kind of conceptual bit of information um, about what's, what's, what's going to happen. And it's, it's in this slide. So this, this slide is, is, is kind of important. Um, so I'll start with a classical question. And um, this is kind of um, may, maybe the main lesson of the MIP equals NX result is that computations. So you could think even of deterministic exponential time computation. Or you can also think of non-deterministic exponential time computations can be verified much more efficiently than they need to, than the amount of time that they need to be carried out. Okay, and this requires a few steps. You can take your large computation. You can write down the whole tableau of the computation. You'll encode that tableau in an error correcting code. You'll choose the error correcting code wisely, just as uh, Yate was talking about, so that you can build a probabilistically checkable proof out of it. And then you're able to check validity of the entire computation by making just a few random local checks to this uh, appropriately encoded uh, proof, okay? So there's an exponential savings in decision time um, 
uh, by moving from just, or in ver uh, computation, by moving from decision to verification and allowing uh, random local checks. Okay. Okay, so now here's another question. What if we try to apply this idea of exponential savings in, in a computation, not starting with a deterministic or non-deterministic computation, but starting directly with an interactive proof, which is the model that we've been working uh, on. So what if we take now an interactive proof like this, this is just a classical interactive proof, but let's think of it as an exponential time uh, verifier. So this verifier runs in exponential time, and I don't want to do that, I want to verify the verifier, okay? So could I do that? So there's two things that this verifier does. Uh, the first thing that it does is it chooses questions, and the second thing that it does is that it, it gets answers and it verifies them. So the part about delegating the verification of the answers, uh, that can be done. In fact, for those of you who know, it's the idea behind proof, behind uh, composition of PCPs. Uh, you can reduce to the case where the verification of answers procedure is deterministic. So it's just some deterministic exponential time computation, and you can kind of delegate that. The tricky part is the, the questions, right? And kind of like, obviously, there's no way to delegate the sampling of questions. I mean, I could tell these guys to generate their own questions, but I have to verify they do it correctly. Uh, and the problem is that there is no such thing as a correct question. All questions are correct. What's important is how they're generated, okay? And they need to choose the randomness correctly. If I allow them to choose the random string themselves, then they choose a random string that kind of like generates, you know, just like some really easy question that they just always get the same question and it's just not gonna work out, right? And so you don't even think about it, that's it, it's, it's done. MIP equals the next, there's no way to push it forward. Um, except if you can use quantum mechanics, okay? So um, it, it, it's, I mean, it's well known that uh, quantum mechanics is a, is, 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 is a probabilistic theory. So the, the measurement rule, the Born rule says that uh, you, you observe uh, outcomes with, with, with probabilities. They're not necessarily deterministic. A little bit less well known, um, you know, maybe for people who don't do this, but, I, but actually very well known in, in quantum information since the, the birth of the field in the 1990s is that not only is quantum mechanics uh, random, but it's random in a way that can be verified. Um, and that, that's the idea behind quantum cryptography, behind quantum key distribution. It's the idea that if you have a quantum system that is supposed to generate random bits according to a certain distribution, you can do some tests on it. And these are not quantum tests. They're just tests on the distribution uh, that's being generated to make sure that this distribution is really uniformly random distribution. Uh, you need that in order to do cryptography. You want to make sure that your keys are uniformly random and uncorrelated with you know, whatever you need them to be uncorrelated with. Uh, so it's known since even before that time that there are some linear functions. Here's an example of them. It's a famous one. Um, so the CHSH linear function, CHSH are initials of the people who, who found it. That is such that um, there's a unique quantum optimum, just, just like before. And this unique quantum optimum has the property that, you know, the probabilities, if you list them, and if you look just as the marginal distribution on the A answers, Prover 1's answers, this is a uniform distribution. So that's a linear function and it has a unique optimum and the unique optimum, the way to achieve it, you have to generate uniformly random bits. These uniformly random bits have to be correlated in a very peculiar way with the other party. But if you look at just one party, it's uniformly random. So, you know, there we are. Uh, we have a way to test that someone generates uniformly random bits. So why don't we build on that and uh, delegate the question distribution uh, to the provers by just making sure that they actually use exactly the right distribution. So that's a good idea. Uh, and then it, it, there's a bit of work in order to make it, uh, to, to implement it. Um, two particular uh, uh, difficulties that you have is, one, uh, you need to do this in a very efficient way. Okay, so this CHSH inequality, it's good, but in order to test one bit of randomness, it kind of requires you know, one bit of effort. Uh, and in quantum crypto, this is what happens to generate uh, N bits of key, you need to put in omega of N uh, amount of effort. So you are testing the randomness, but you're not doing it efficiently. Um, so one of the things that we did is uh, build on the PCP literature uh, and this quantum linearity test that I, that I described before, but do that for more advanced tests, multilinearity tests, low degree tests, in order to get efficient tests uh, for randomness, okay? So you have exponential savings between the amount of randomness that you generate and the amount of effort that's required in terms of the length of the questions, the verification time in order to generate this randomness. Um, that, that's one difficulty. Uh, and the other difficulty um, that, that was tackled by uh, Natarayan and Wright um, a couple of years ago is that, you know, it's not only about uniform distributions. What makes these two prover systems special is that the questions are correlated in a very specific way. You don't always send the same uniformly random question or independent uniformly random question. So it's a bit more subtle. 
And so you need to come up with tests that make sure that each of the prover generates the right distribution and it's correlated in the right way with the other person. And that, and that, that you know, that's a bit delicate, but, um, but they did that. And once you've done that, um, they were already able to show like one more step, one more exponential improvement, uh, going from NX to NEE, that's like two exponentials. So you delegate MIP equals NX to MIP star, and you get that inclusion. And once you've done it once, you, you know, you go, okay, well, <laughs> why don't we continue? Surely there must be some parameter uh, that blows up, okay? Maybe not the randomness, maybe not the question language, some other parameter blows up. You can't do this forever. Um, and, and so actually you can, um, it, it requires a little bit more work, but this is, this is what we did a couple of years ago uh, by iterating this argument and not only iterating, but taking a limit, uh, we're able to show that the class RE, so RE is uh, larger than any deterministic or non-deterministic bounded time class. Uh, it stands for recursively enumerable. So it's all languages such that there's an algorithmic procedure that lists um, valid instances, uh, but, but it, there's no bound in the amount of time. Um, it, it's not hard to show that there's a matching upper bound. Um, this was known for a while. We just, we just didn't think that it would be the correct upper bound, but it, it turns out that it is. And so that, that gives the equality that, 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 that I had that as title for the talk. It's surprising equality because on the right-hand side, you have a model that involves polynomial time, um, polynomial time verification. Um, there's quantum, sure, but it's still polynomial time verification. On the left-hand side, you have an absolutely huge class. Um, in fact, a, a complete problem for RE is, is the halting problem. That's an undecidable problem. Okay, so some undecidable problems can be verified in classical polynomial time if you interact with a quantum system. And just, just if you're a complexity theorist and you've thought about these interactive proof classes, it's, 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 it's a surprising result. So that, that's the complexity theoretic motivation for the problem. Uh, but, but I'll just wrap up by, by circling back to Tilson's problem. So now I've been you know, talking a lot about complexity theory um, and my motivation was to design interesting linear functionals. Um, uh, so let, let's go back uh, to the sets and, and I, let me tell you now why uh, from this complexity theoretic equality, we've actually managed to show that there's a separation between the two sets. It's a, it's a tiny bit of a subtle and surprising argument, but let me go over it. So these are the two sets that Tilson was interested in, okay? Two sets of two, two different ways that um, you can model correlations in quantum mechanics and we're trying to show that they're not equal. So we're trying to come up with a linear function. I'm actually not gonna come up with it explicitly, though we can do it, but right now I'll just uh, show you an existence argument, why there must exist such a linear function. Okay, so one thing I could have said earlier on, but I didn't want you to forget about it, is that if you're studying this, like a very natural question from a computer scientist point of view is, I told you it might be hard to optimize this linear function over these sets, but what is known? Um, there's two things that are known. One I already mentioned is like experiments. So it is possible to approach uh, the tensor product value by below just by doing exhaustive search. So you just say, okay, let me fix dimensions for everything for my Hilbert spaces. Let me discretize everything and let me increase everything, the dimension, the accuracy, and I get better and better by exhaustive search, better and better strategies. And you can show that this exhaustive search um, converges by below to, to one of the values. Now, much more work um, is showing that there is also a refutation procedure uh, that approaches the other value from above. So for those of you who know, this is a non-commutative version of the sum of squares hierarchy uh, that you can apply to these correlations. It's a sequence of semi-definite programs of increasing size that gives you values that are upper bounds on, on this here. Okay, so this is known. It's known that there's always an algorithm that approaches this value from below and an algorithm that approaches this value from above. So now if the two values are equal and you have an algorithm that approaches from below and an algorithm from, that approaches from above, then the problem of deciding or approximating this value is, is decidable. You have two algorithms that converge to the same thing. But I just showed that there must exist some linear functions uh, that comes from these interactive proofs. Um, for which computing the optimum is undecidable. Uh, this one, this is the one that, that's associated with the classes. So computing this value is undecidable. So these two algorithms cannot match. And one of them goes to the blue optimum, the other to the purple optimum. So these two optimum must be different. Um, and so this, this difference is shown, uh, follows from the, uh, the undecidability result. Okay, so let me, uh, let, let, let me just wrap up. Um, so so I, I told you about this, uh, this equality. Um, and the, one of the things that I find interesting about it is, is, is all the different uh, strands uh, or threads of research that it, it builds on. There's all this work that happened in, um, 
in, in complexity theory, it was completely unrelated. And then we we're connecting that to um, insights from quantum information in order to obtain a surprising result in complexity theory that has applications to, to you know, areas that were disconnected from it since, since the 1930s, uh, sort of. There's many open questions. I don't want to, to, to say too much. One of them is just to circle back on this, this notion of a group being not hyperlinear. Not so fake is a related notion in case someone knows about it. These are questions that group theorists care a lot about. They've been open for a very, very long time. Uh, it would be nice if every group was hyperlinear. I think the intuition is that it shouldn't be the case because um, groups are just very diverse. Um, but this is still open um, because the conjecture that every group is hyperlinear is a bit stronger um, than Kant's embedding problem. So this is an open conjecture. There's, there's actually a pretty clear path to showing this based on refining the complexity work that we did. Um, it's a clear path, but it's not an easy path. So, so I just, I, I don't know about this. Uh, a question that I'm particularly interested in is if we can use any of the work that was done there to make progress on a conjecture in, in quantum complexity theory that's, that's been uh, open for, for a while. It was discussed at the program in 2014 already, but there's not that much work on it, which is a quantum analog of the PCP conjecture. Um, that's a question that the mathematicians care about. They see this proof and it involves undecidability and it, it just doesn't make sense that this would be needed. So, you know, someone has to, to simplify it. And there's many technical questions, but these maybe I'll just reserve uh, for the coffee break if anyone is, is interested. Uh, so, so let me stop here. Hey, Thomas, great talk and great result, of course. I still find it unbelievable. So, so you, you showed that so there's a proof system that in a finite amount of time can show that the program terminates, in a sense. So that's in a risk. So the question is uh, so, so the halting problem is in a risk. So the question is, is there some extended notion of proof system for which one could also prove uh, in finite amount of time that the program does not terminate? Yeah. The complement of the halting problem. Yeah, that's a good question. It's not known yet, but um... There is, I think it's not known yet, uh, but there is reasons to think. So I regret now that I wasn't fully precise. So I developed a model of quantum interactive proofs, um, you know, and the strategies are quantum. I didn't actually tell you what of my two mathematical models was used to define the complexity class. Uh, so I didn't say it, but it's the blue version, the tensor product version. That's the version that's been accepted. Um, you can ask what complexity class do you get if you take the, the purple model. So now you have a now we know that it's a broader class of strategies and that class is included in co-RE. Um, so it would be natural to show that the complement of the halting problem is, is complete for it. And it's, it's not known, um, um, but the, it, it's likely to be, to be the case. Um, so if you just change the mathematical model for your quantum correlations, you might, you might go from RE to co-RE and go back and forth. So, so just to be clear, uh, even though uh, this class uh, where you allow all commuting uh, uh, operators is uh, broader, you're saying the uh, corresponding interactive proofs is not is just incomparable. It's not uh, it's yeah. not bigger. Yeah. So that's the same thing that could have happened between MIP and MIP star. It ended up, you know, just because you allow more strategies, they can become incomparable. So for MIP star, it became it became bigger. So they are comparable. It is bigger. But there, it seems that that they are going to be incomparable. Um, yeah. Even though, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I had a question. The two models uh, for quantum. Uh, uh, which of them is considered to be physical and which is not? Ah, well, that's a great question. Ask a physicist. Um, uh, I, we don't know, um, you know, physics is like, uh, um, I mean, one of them is broader than the other. So the, the more restricted one is, you know, almost truly physical, like all these experiments that I described, they verify points in the more restricted set. So you could say, well, does physics allow the broader set, you know, because I, mathematicians allow it, but does physics... And if you look at the most general uh, uh, versions of quantum mechanics, so quantum field theory, relativistic quantum field theory, and you look at the most permissive axioms for quantum, well, for quantum field theory, in principle, it allows it. So in principle, there is an experiment in quantum field theory that would show, that would demonstrate a point that's in the purple, but not in the blue set. Uh, it's in principle because to do an experiment 
you need a little bit more than just say these are the axioms. You need an actual um, theory. Um, and in practice, all the theories that people manage to get their hands on, they are such that for these theories, they make extra assumptions and the two models coincide. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not clear if there could be a physical experiment that separates them, but in, in principle, in, in the most permissive mo models, there could be. Yeah. Hi. So I have a question. So, you know, for MIP star is equal to RE. Do you think there is some limited notion of quantum, you know, uh, that you allow some limited type of like quantum communication between the parties, maybe somehow between RE and NX? Yeah. Uh, so that, that part is not completely nailed down. But um, so, okay, just to make it precise, what the result says is that just in the context of the halting problem, is if you take a Turing machine, and that Turing machine halts in a certain amount of time, okay, but you don't know, there is a proof system such that the provers are going to succeed with probability one in that proof system as soon as the Turing machine halts. Now, what amount of resources is needed for them in order to convince you that the Turing machine halts? That amount of resources scales with the time that the Turing machine uh, takes to halt. So in particular, the amount of entanglement they require is gonna scale polynomially with the runtime of the Turing machine. So the Turing machine doesn't halt, there's no finite amount of entanglement that's going to be okay for them, that's going to allow them to succeed, and that's the soundness of our proof system, so it's fine. If the Turing machine doesn't halt, does halt, sorry, in some amount of time, they're going to need that amount of entanglement. So now if you cap the amount of entanglement that they're able to use, they become unable to convince you of uh, the fact that the Turing machine halts if it just takes too long to halt. So you could study a related class where the amount of entanglement is like E, you know, E qubits of entanglement, and say what's the the time complexity class that you're able to verify there. And I think there's an exponential gap between uh, the upper bound that you can show and the lower bound, but there's going to be a whole hierarchy of such things. And if you allow more entanglement, you'll get NX and double EX and triple E and you, um, yeah. So it's, yeah. Hi, um, so I was wondering um, like what you think about like how this complexity theoretic result could actually maybe um, motivate us to try to understand like which of the two um, sets is kind of like the right one for quantum mechanics. Cause it seemed like oh. since you show that there's a separation now there's kind of this question of like um, which set is the right one. Um, and um, I was wondering if there are instances in physics where like it actually matters because you said like most of the theories, the two sets actually coincide. Um, yeah, so it's kind of unfortunate that both of them involve undecidable problems, right? Because you could have had some very strong intuition that you can't embed undecidable problems in physical systems um, and or some related intuition maybe might, might have much you know, motivated you to say, this is not physical because it's just, it's, um, okay, or do, do you want to say? No. So, um, so sorry, but um, but but this 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 separation is is when you have a prover, right? So so if you if you sort of take away the prover and you say, well, are these two theories equivalent or not? That's a separate question. And yeah. what's the answer there? Yeah, yeah, okay. So maybe an important clarification point is it it's not like uh, yeah, which is right. It's not like the result doesn't say that uh, there's there's physical processes that solve undecidable problems, right? Right? Not not at all. Uh, in order to succeed in the proof system, the provers have to know the answer of the halting problem, and we're, we're not saying how they figure that out. Right? I'm just they're just they're just giving it to it, and that that's a purely just hypothetical situation. Um, uh, okay, so 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 that's true. Um, okay, so I guess you're saying that uh, the result by itself doesn't have an implication for what's physically realizable or not. I think that's fair. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I think you can, can you, Mike? Yeah. Otherwise, I don't hear. Yeah. Um. I guess my main question was, um, like, what does this result, or like, how could this result, um, maybe help, uh, us understand, like, what, like, what mathematical, um, like, what mathematics we should be using for 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 quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the short answer is that it, it doesn't really, you know, it just, it just says that there's, there's two, there's a difference between the two models, but um, 
I don't think it gives a strong indication one way or the other. Um, uh, at least I don't see it. Um, and, and as I, I guess, uh, in my answer to, to Prasad, um, you know, in, in, in practice and with a very, very lenient sense of practice, it actually doesn't make a difference, right? Because any kind of physical, physical even not, not system, like theory that you can theoretically as a physicist, put your hands on and do any kind of calculation, the two sets are gonna be equal. Um, so it's, it, it's really, if you're doing foundations work that it, that it might make a difference. And there, I don't know, you know, I don't know. So I'm wondering, actually, if you step down from Ari all the way down to Earth, and you know, you have actually something that's, uh, I don't know, even in P, okay? How short can these prove? Because essentially, you can, you know, recursively make the verifier more and more and more efficient. So how succinct will these? Yeah, I mean, so polynomial in the description size of the Turing machine. Um, so constant? If the I mean, if the Turing depends on your Turing machine. Yeah. So if uh, I have like a constant Turing machine doing a really, really, uh, you know, difficult computation. I mean, if you only talk about constant things, then you have to ask what's the constant prefactor, and I don't know what you know because constants are always. But uh, yeah, in, in principle, yeah. So I, I mean, I think this is a potentially interesting question. Like, I don't have an application for it. Like, if I saw a way to um, that an answer to that question might help towards quantum PCP theorem or these kinds of things, then I would study it no, more. But, but, but the question is a little bit doing when MIP equals NX was shown. And then you asked that question, you said, okay, well, we don't care about NX, we want polynomial size things, and how can we you know, bring it back down? And we care about the proof line, and we start constructing PCPs, et cetera. And you're kind of asking there, what kind of objects would you, would you get if you just said, what I'm interested in is a polynomial time computation. That's what I want to delegate. And then what's my effort? Um, yeah, so I think it's a good question. I, yeah. It can be worked out, but... Thank you, Toma, for taking us through a wonderful journey through physics, math, and computer science. Yes. Thank you. So we'll recon.